Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Game to the Com video, we're going to be discussing processors galore. We're going to be starting things out with Intel, despite the fact that it's not first alphabetically, Intel's news is a bit uh, quicker to go through, so we're definitely going to be talking about their 8th generation of processors, as they've released some information on their annual Investors Day conference, which details the performance we're going to be expecting over Kaby Lake with their Canon Lake architecture, and then we're going to be focusing squarely on Ryzen. There's yet more information on pricing, possible release dates, architecture information, and the normal stuff has popped up onto the internet. We'll go through that la later, but first of all, the 8th generation, also known as Canon Lake. Now, naturally, this is successor to Kaby Lake, which in itself was the successor to Sky Lake. We don't know a lot of stuff, only that Intel are aiming for a better performance with Sysmark, which is quite important because, you know, we don't know how that's going to translate to, say, games. We don't know how that's going to translate to a wider suite of applications. <clears throat> but with Sysmark, at the very least, and an i7 8th generation processor, they are hoping to beat performance by over 15%, which is not shabby. Now, how they're going to manage to achieve that is going to be down to your imagination. Like, <clears throat> is it going to be primarily clock speed orientated? Are we going to start seeing some actual architecture changes as well? We're not 100% sure at the moment. So, we'll have to just wait. And obviously, there have been a few leaks. There have been a few murmurs on exactly what Intel are doing. But until we actually get official uh, confirmation the process is actually out, it's better just to uh, hold the fort on that. But Ryzen is where it starts to get a little more complex, and there is a lot of information uh, popping up about Ryzen, and a whole bunch of you have messaged me uh, leaks that have popped up even now, actually. I'm still getting messages. So I'd like to thank the following people, um, and I'm possibly going to miss a couple of people out. Paul, uh, Luca, Rod, Curtis, Eugene, Henrik, and... I believe there was one or two other people as well. So if I've missed your name, I'm really sorry. But so many people have messaged me differently, um, different links. Uh, everything from Reddit to picture uploads to uh, websites, which are, um, or rather sh online shops, which are hosting uh, or have previously had the pricing listing up and then had to remove it. And you get the idea. Now, let's start things out, shall we? So, the first things first, this is still unofficial. The reason I'm stressing that is because at the end of the day, we don't know uh, if these prices are going to be indicative of final retail, but it's looking increasingly like the prices that have popped up are pretty accurate. So, the pricing for a lot of these um, samples which have popped up have also been now removed. So, I could start providing the links. Unfortunately, they're just nuked, and I'm assuming the retailers in question have probably been getting slaps on the wrist from AMD. However, multiple stores have actually popped up in the US and in Europe, and even some from the UK, which hint at very similar pricing. Now, some of them, for example, in the United Kingdom, do exclude that. But... Um, shop BLT, just for the sake of argument, which has removed the pricing, uh, just to clarify, have various processors, or had various processors this do. Uh, this includes the 1800X for 490 US dollars, the R7 1700X, which is 381 US dollars. I'm rounding it up, I'm not counting the few cents at the end. And finally, the 1700 which is a 65 watt TDP processor at 316 US dollars. Now, as we discussed yesterday, the primary difference between the top two processors is that the 1800X has a higher clock speed, whereas the 1700 has also only a 65 watt TDP, which is definitely something to bear in mind. Interestingly as well, the 1700 appears to come with a Wraith cooler, whereas the other ones do not. Interestingly, and I know I keep using that word, but still, another retailer, um, this one called Kika, Kika Tech, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, have leaked uh, prices in pounds. 
365, uh, I'm going down sequentially here, 365, 283, and the bargain of the century is the 1700, which is just 235 Great British Pounds. These are without VAT. So obviously you've got to add about 20% on top of that, which brings the prices to roughly in line of what you'd expect. But even so, that's a bloody good deal, dude. I mean, that's a really good deal. Even if you factor in the fact that, um, you know, for gaming, you've got the whole thing of they're going to be running at slower clock speeds, probably than KB Lake if you overclock. You might have this weird situation where for like DirectX 11 games, especially if you're not 100% GPU bound, KB Lake might outperform Ryzen. I'm guessing this. I don't have a Ryzen review sample to check. Um, but if you're running, let's say, DirectX 12 that's used the classic ashes of the singularity, and it's non-GPU-bound scenarios, so you're using, I don't know, two 1080s or something like that, then you might find that Ryzen does start outperforming it because you do have those additional threads available. We now have the information available to us to how to decode the code names of AMD's Ryzen processors. This is thanks to um, Canard PC, who have had access to numerous engineering samples and therefore have finally understood how AMD are labeling them, and then that information was dispersed onto the internet, where Reddit then got hold of it and started to, well, basically turn it into a chart. I won't necessarily read out all of it because most of it is pretty self-explanatory as you're reading it, but you've got the generation prototype, the base frequency, the revision number, the TDP, the stepping, the uh, boost frequency, the package type, number of cores, and so on and so on. So it's pretty self-explanatory when you're actually seeing it, and once again, in the future, in a couple of years' time, you know, or a year's time when this is pretty still, you know, pretty standard on the retail shelves, it's not going to really mean much. But until then, as we're getting these leaks, it does help us discern what processes are what, especially when, like, the 6 and the 4 core ones start popping up. Finally, I want to discuss one final point, which has uh, appeared on the internet, and that is yet more information from International Solid State Circuits Conference, where we have further information on the actual cause of the Ryzen processor. I won't do too much of an analysis on this because it's kind of outside the remit of the time I've got available today because as folks know, I'm still doing some reviews in the background and it's kind of limiting my time for analysis. But if folks do want, I can put something out on it. So we already know that Zen is manufactured by Global Foundries on a 14NM FinFET processor. AMD are claiming Zen will be able to compete with Skylake in terms of uh, the Intel side of things anyway, in terms of single threaded performance and power efficiency. Whether that's true or not, well, we're going to just have to wait until benchmarks, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's roughly on par depending upon the application. Clock speed is a different issue. So will Ryzen be able to scale linearly in terms of clocks as well as like Skylake, Cable Lake? We just don't know. There are some definite differences, however, with the actual architecture between Ryzen and Intel. Despite the fact that we have hyper-threading, or shall I say SMT, on um, the Ryzen processor, and Ryzen as an actual part is a lot more similar to, let's say, Intel's way of doing things than the older, like Excavator or Bulldozer or whatever else. But the actual chip is quite different. Basically, Intel's process is more dense, and so what you start having is that AMD's design complexity might be a bit lower. But there is still high bandwidth load latency data transfer. Uh, they've got a wider micro-op dispatch, larger instruction schedulers, uh, 168 entry RF with 12 read and 6 write ports, new generation hardware prefetch, simultaneous multi-threading, branch, branch misprediction, all of that stuff we've discussed in the architecture analysis I put out a while ago, so you can certainly type Zen um, Zen analysis on the channel and it'll pop up. But basically all of this means that the processor is a lot better at not just handling uh, instructions in flight, but also scheduling uh, various instructions and various operations across the processor and much better at predicting what way code is going to be branching. Basically the processor is also a lot more efficient when it comes to handling memory and handling instructions and not needing to keep pulling data from memory. So for example if it already has an instruction because 
the cache is a lot wider, a lot faster. It can simply just farm out of the caches, pull that instruction out a lot faster. And basically, it's just a lot more efficient. Now, AMD is stating that it's over 40% IPC over the previous generation. We knew that already. Um, physical design, 12 layer metal telescoping snack. Flexibility per core voltage and voltage control and frequency control. Level 2 and level 3 bit cells on separate uh, power supply. Advanced frequency, voltage and temperature sensors. Uh, basically, all of this stuff is AMD's clock gating and basically their fine grain frequency control. Basically, all this means is that the CPU itself will be a lot better at regulating how power is distributed across the processor. To give you an idea, this means... Uh, let's say that it's handling a lot of integer instructions and not much floating point work, then it can shut down the relevant parts of the CPU which are not handling of that particular CPU core, which are not handling um, integer work. So it would shut down the floating point units, for example. This theoretically means power consumption is going to be lower, which also means, at least in theory, heat is going to be less of an issue. As you could see, You've got the core functional units. So you can see an overall die shot of what you've got inside, including the cores, 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache, the floating point units, the ALUs, and all that stuff. Uh, this was one image that we already saw yesterday, state-of-the-art comparison. Competitor. I don't really feel I need to tell you what the competitor is. It's Skylake, of course. And you can see the differences in area. It's 44 mm squared versus 49 mm squared per core. And cache... Uh, level 2 cache and all of that stuff is obviously different. How much of a difference any of this makes in reality when we're actually using the processor? Well, who knows? It's something for AMD to boast about, you know, for tech heads, but I think most people are really going to be more caring about, you know, what the actual performance of the chips are. And yet more information on adaptive voltage controls, frequency tuning. It's kind of cool stuff, but... Um, Perhaps the biggest one is the uh, fact that the chips theoretically will be cheaper for AMD to produce. And that's possibly going to be one of the reasons that we're seeing Ryzen being so competitive in terms of pricing. That naturally will also mean how Intel are forced to either take some cuts into its profit margins or keep their pricing very similar and therefore leave a very interesting point, uh, choice and decision for customers. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.